All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are going to be in Matthew chapter 21 today. Matthew chapter 21 today. This is what is known as Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday is not actually written anywhere in the Bible. This is a man-made title that is given to this time. But this is the week before Easter. And at the time, obviously, nobody knew that this would be Easter and what we deem as Easter. So the time that is, that, or what is taking place here is very important to understand leading up to Easter. So let's go ahead and say a word of prayer and then we'll dive in. That'll give you a chance to, to turn to Matthew chapter 21 right from the beginning. Father God, would you just watch over this time that we have together, Lord, um, for each one of us. Lord, help us to just hit the pause button, just relax, just to stay calm and just to rest in your word. But at the same time, God, help us to listen to these words today through your gospel and help us to understand what great news it is that we can take with us and that we can share and show to others. Lord, even during this time where we have to be distant from people, God, with technology and all the amazing things that you've given us, God, we can touch people in, in a mighty way. Lord, help us to do so because of the love that you've poured into each and every one of us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Right from the beginning, this is known as the triumphal entry, one, also not in the Bible, but a, a title that is given. And it says, As they, meaning Jesus and the disciples, approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now, some people look at these verses, and the first thing they do is well, they wonder, well, how is it that that Jesus knew that there would be a donkey and a colt tied to a tree. And was this a friend of Jesus that they had come forward to, that they had already had this plan set up? There's a couple things in here that show us that this is actually not the case. And the first thing that is talked about is that it's, he says, untie these and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them the Lord needs them and he will, and he will send them right away. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, he doesn't, he doesn't give the exact name. He doesn't say, okay, if uh, Bob or if Pete or whoever, if they tell you, you know, it's a buddy of mine, he's a friend of mine, go ahead and untie it, it you know, th then he'll, he'll make sure that he sends it because this is Jesus. And he'll know that it was Jesus that sent it. He doesn't do that. The people at this time know that Passover is coming. And Passover is the largest feast of the year. And so when Jesus shares with them that, hey, there's going to be a donkey and a colt that is tied to a tree there, this is showing that there are believers that believe that at this time of Passover that God is going to deliver them. And also, what Jesus shares is, when you share this, say, the Lord. It's the Lord that needs these. He didn't say, oh, Jesus needs these. He said, the Lord needs these. Once again, the Old Testament believer would know that that meant that, hey, God was coming and God was going to show up in a mighty way, and it was going to be supported by what had been shared within Scripture. So the only one that would have a donkey and a, and a colt tied to a tree would be someone that knew the Old Testament Scriptures, understood the Old Testament Scriptures, knew that at the time that Passover was coming that this was the biggest time of the year and that eventually at some point in some time God was going to show up in a mighty way. And the next verse it says this. It says this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And it says say to the daughter of Zion see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey on a colt the foal of a donkey. And this comes from Isaiah and Zechariah. Once again this is that fulfillment of scripture. But Jesus didn't say, hey, my friend that's up there, make sure that you let him know that it's Jesus. All they had to do was to go and look for this donkey and this colt. And so the disciples are being taught the scripture that, this, these, that somehow, somewhere in this next village was already known by these Old Testament believers. Watch what happens next. It said, The disciples went ahead and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. We're going to stop here for a moment. Jesus never, to this point within the Bible, 
is like, look at me within my public ministry. Hey, look at, look at the things I've started. If you look at the first miracle that Jesus ever performed, they were at a celebration at a wedding, but Jesus wasn't the one who said, watch the things that I'm going to do. Watch as I change the, wa the, wa the water into wine. He never did that. It was his mom who said, okay, go and do this. Show them these miracles because she obviously had witnessed other miracles that Jesus had done privately. But it was the beginning of his public ministry, but Jesus didn't say, this is the beginning of my public ministry. Just as he's about to come into this city, he isn't coming in to say, look at me as the king. Instead, he knows that this is fulfilling the scripture that was said from the Old Testament prophet. And in that Old Testament pro the, from that Old Testament prophet, it says, See, your king comes to you. And so this is that king of Israel that they all have been preparing for and waiting for all of this time for the chosen people. They've been looking for this king to enter. And when he enters, he's going to do so exactly as he is about, as Jesus is about to show them with this donkey on this colt. So all of this is fulfilling prophecy, but at the same time, Jesus isn't out promoting himself as the king. He isn't saying, hey, guess what? Um, make sure that you let everyone know when you go in there, let the guy that you're getting the donkey and, and the colt from, make sure that you let him know and tell him to tell his friends and tell everyone, because guess what? They're going to have this opportunity to see the king of Israel coming. Jesus doesn't do that. And yet, this is a public time that it's about to take place, and you can't help but wonder, you know, did G was Jesus a little bit uncomfortable with this? And a part of him may have been and may have felt that on the inside, but he knew at the end of the day that he was doing exactly what it was that God wanted him to do. So here he comes, and they, they place this on the colt. They put the cloaks on the back of it. They're ready to come into the town. And it says, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. These branches most likely would have been palm branches, which is where the term Palm Sunday comes, because in this area, within this culture, this is the kind of trees they would have had. So they would cut these branches from, from the different trees, so they would lay, these, lay this down, and that palm branch was actually meant as a sign of peace. It's very important to understand this, that when God was coming, He was coming to bring peace. And yet, when they were laying their cloaks down, the people there, by laying their cloaks down, they were recognizing Jesus as royalty. This is what you would do for a king. So they're recognizing Him as the king, and they're laying this down to bring peace and to recognize the peace that is being brought. They would have had the time to do so because Jesus would have been on a donkey that was, or on a colt, the donkey is leading the colt, and so everyone can see this coming from however far away. All of the people that are watching for this are in the city of Jerusalem, and they have been waiting for this for generation after generation after generation. And so because a donkey is a slow-moving animal, they would have time to go and, oh my goodness, you got to tell so-and-so, you got to let them know. Grab the family, grab the colt, start cutting down the branches. They have, they have time to do exactly what the scripture would fulfill. And so he is coming slowly toward Jerusalem. And as he is coming in, they're laying down their cloaks. They are recognizing him as a royalty. They are laying down the branches. They're asking, God, would you please bring this peace that we all need? And here's what happens next. So the crowds then went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted. I want to go back here for one second, verse 8. It says, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So they're setting up almost kind of this red carpet type thing in front of him. And it says, The crowds then went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted. So they couldn't help but let everyone know, Guys, listen, that king, that king that we've all been looking for, for. He is here. He is entering the city. Now, when this happens, it's not just the Jewish people that would be noticing this. The Romans would be standing around also, and they're like, okay, something's going on. There's some kind of event that's taking place. There's a lot of things that are happening at the city gate. All the people are running and screaming, and they're yelling. And so, this king is coming in, and they understand that. So, it's th at this time that all the Romans will be taking their swords and getting ready, and hey, guys, let's get ready because there's a king coming. That means there's a fight that's probably going to come with this as well. And when they look down, they hear the people screaming. And they hear them saying this, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. 
Hosanna literally means save now. And so the people are screaming out, save us now, save us now, save us now. And the Roman soldiers that would be there, because it's the only Romans that would be there, the Roman soldiers that would be there would have their swords ready, their clubs ready, and they're looking down and they see a guy riding on a colt. And they're looking to see, okay, where's all the other soldiers that would be there following him? Because if a Roman came in, they would be on a black stallion. And they would be riding in on their horses with the closest guys with them on horses as well. And behind them would be at least a thousand soldiers on foot, ready to fight. And when they look down and there's going to be this fight that's coming, they see one guy on a colt walking slowly through this city. And people are yelling, save us now, save us now. And the people that are yelling, save us now. This is what they want to be saved from. They're saying, God, save us economically. God, would you save us from this military? Would you save us from all the power that they have and show them just how powerful you are? And we're going to overthrow all those things so that way we will be in control from a military standpoint. And that way we will be in control when it comes to the money and the things that we have. So save us now, God, and save us from those very things that hold us back and the very things that oppress us. It continues and it says this, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It doesn't say, blessed be this man named Jesus. It doesn't say, hey, b b uh, blessed be uh, God's son. It says, blessed be the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So it shows us they don't quite know who this is. They just know that he is coming in as a king. They just know that this is fulfilling scripture. And they also know that Passover is coming up. Passover, the most important festival at the time. At this time, there would literally be 2 million or more people coming to the city. All the people that have been scattered all over the world are now coming back to, for this time of Passover. And Passover was something that had taken place before this time about 1,500 years ago. Or, or, excuse me, 1,500 years previous to Jesus coming in. What had happened was... God and Pharaoh were having a, a little tussle back and forth. God was trying to explain to Pharaoh, listen, I'm God. And Pharaoh's like, yeah, yeah, you, you could call yourself God, but I'm the God of this world. And so God kept sending plague after plague after plague. And Pharaoh finally said, okay, you know what? You're showing me some really amazing things, so I'm going to go ahead and let your people go. And then he relented and said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. In fact, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to continue to hold them. And so God said, okay, I'm going to send one last plague. And here's the plague that I'm going to send. We're going to send an angel of death over top of the entire region of Egypt. And because you would not listen, Pharaoh, every single household is going to lose their firstborn son. But the people, the chosen ones, knew that the believers knew that if they were to put blood above their doorposts and on both sides, that when the angel of death came over, he would see that blood. He would see the sacrifice that was made and it would protect the child that was inside the house. So the next day when everyone woke up, the Egyptian sons were dead. But the believers, the chosen people, their sons were alive because the sacrifice had been made and the life that came through the blood allowed them to keep living. And this is part of what is taking place with Jesus coming here. He knows that in the next week that he is about to be that Passover lamb. And he is about to give his blood the, thing, the very thing that brings life so that for all those that believe, they are protected by God forever. It's the final sacrifice. And here's the amazing thing. The first sacrifice that was ever made in the Bible was made by God. Adam and Eve are in the garden. They are living in a perfect society. They have everything. And all God said was, just don't eat from this tree. And yet they chose to. And when that happened, when both of them ate of it, sin had entered the world. And they could see things that they didn't see to this, to this point. So God did what only God would do. And he made the first sacrifice. And it cost them the blood of the animals to cover Adam and Eve. And from that time, from the Old Testament time on, people brought their sacrifices to make up for that sin. The very life of that animal, they would burn the blood and that would be the sacrifice made to God. 
The issue with that is it was a constantly a guilt offering or a guilt sacrifice that was made. God did this to protect the ones that he loved. He made the sacrifice to protect, protect those that he loved. But we got so caught in the guilt that we missed out on the grace. When God is going to send His Son as far as the sacrifice goes, it's going to take away all that guilt and it's going to bring us that grace. Grace meaning God's riches at Christ's expense. And Jesus understands this. And He understands that He has to go about this publicly. He has to ride into the city. He has to go and do exactly what it is that Scripture fulfills so that He can walk to His death on the cross to make that final sacrifice for you and for me. It continues. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed in the highest. Excuse me, save now in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? He wasn't wearing a name tag. He wasn't, hey, I'm Jesus. He wasn't announcing who he, he didn't do any of those things. And yet the city, it was so much, uh, some versions say it quaked. It literally, like the, the city actually shook because there was so much a murmur. Someone, oh my goodness, that's what's happening. You, you got to tell this, go grab your family. It started to shake the very foundation of the city. This was that big an event that was taking place. And all of the people are talking and Jesus is saying nothing. Jesus is just fulfilling the very word of God. Jesus once again knows that within this following week that is coming up, this is the final public thing that he has to do for God to take him to the final sacrifice that God is about to make. And it was such a big stir that it shook the very city to its foundation. So everybody knows that this King of Kings, this Lord of Lords, is coming. And he's walking through the very streets, the very city that God had set aside. The verses continue. It says, The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in, in Galilee. So it was the crowd that announced who Jesus was. It was a crowd that announced that this king that's riding in, this is the prophet, the prophet that we saw from Nazareth in Galilee. And this is where it continues. He has this entrance as a king, and yet he does it so humbly. So the Roman soldiers and all that that are ready to fight, they're, they're ready to, okay, there's a king coming in, we're going to be throwing down. They're laughing at this, and they're already getting ready, or, I'm sorry, already starting to mock Jesus. Because, okay, you've got no one with you, and it's you as one, and it's all of us that are here that have all the power. And don't forget that. We are the ones that are in control, and we are the ones with the power. So this is funny to them. This is almost kind of like a joke, but are you kidding me? This is what you're going to come at us with? This, this, this guy on a colt? This is all you've got? I mean, all these generations, all these years we've been in power, and this is, you know, we've been preparing for this fight, and, and this is going to be our fight? Whatever. You guys have nothing. And so this event takes place, and watch what happens with Jesus and the first thing that he chooses to do. It says, Jesus at the temple. Jesus entered the temple. So he gets off of the colt. He, he comes to God's very house. He gets off the colt. And he says, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. These are all of the sacrifices being made. The money was being changed because the, the sacrifice that people would bring in, theirs wasn't good enough. So, hey, you know what? Change your sacrifice. We'll give you some money back for it. And this whole area... This part of the church, this part of the temple, was, was now being used for commerce. It says, He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, He said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. I wanted to share the background as we're heading into Passover so that you can understand the importance of what this next week means. But at the same time that we can make this a personal message. Because that time of Passover has never been done since because it wasn't needed because of this sacrifice that Jesus is on his way to making. But Jesus stopped first at the temple. And within each one of us, we have to make this decision if we're going to make this message a personal one. And it starts with our temple and who we are. There is something in your life and something in my life. And the first thing that I need to do is I need to overturn some tables. 
Because, as Jesus said, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. God intends for you and for me to be a house of prayer. To speak with Him without ceasing. To talk with Him nonstop. To have a conversation with Him with all the craziness, all the panic, everything that is going on within our world. But we can't reach and care for others until we first take care of the temple. What Jesus knew then is the same thing that is going on. There is something that is robbing you and is robbing me from worshiping God how we intend to and how God intended us to. And it's time to turn over the tables. It's time to go in and take a look and take an inventory and say enough is enough. Spring is coming up. Spring is a time of year when we have a, a term called spring cleaning. And this started in this nation. And what the Jews would do is they would come and they'd bring the entire family together and they would clean everything out to make sure there was no yeast anywhere within the household. The yeast represented the evil. And so with you personally, with me personally, it's spring cleaning time. And the first step that we need to take is we need to overturn the tables 100%. And we could have to look at it and be honest with ourselves and say, this is what is robbing me of worshiping God. It could be a past thing that took place. It could be words that people have said to you. It could be the time that you were put down. It could be a past addiction. Whatever it might be, a struggle that you have personally that you haven't given 100% to God. And until you turn those tables over, you can't turn your temple into a house of prayer. It's a personal thing. But it starts there. Because, see, we as the church, eventually we've talked about this, how we're going to come back together to worship. We need to start preparing for that time. And the way to prepare for that time is for us to take a personal inventory and to turn over the money tables and to turn, take, cast those money changers out. Why? Because whatever that is that you have and whatever it is that I have, it's robbing us of, of loving a God who first loved us. The verse continues, it says, My house will be called a house of, of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Verse 14, The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. When we turn those tables over, there is healing in it. When we have taken whatever it is that is robbing us from our time with God, there is healing in it. It's the same for the church. The church should be a place that people can come so they can be healed. It shouldn't be a place that people come to where, oh my goodness, look at the power that we have. Look how we can lord over other people. Look how we can tell people you've got to act this way or be this way and throw guilt after guilt after guilt trip on people. We need to be a place of grace. We need to extend that grace and we need to expect that grace from other believers. When we... Turn the tables over. When we turn our own temple into a house of prayer, we can then start the healing process, whatever that might be. In this case, it talks about the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. See, that's a physical side. But the physical side are what other people could see. We don't know how he could have healed other people by this is finally the time when the Lord of Lords has finally come and they brings them a peace on the inside because we can't see that. And yet for you and for me, it's what we need. We need to have that peace on the inside so we can deal with all the things that are going on on the outside. So it starts with prayer and then it leads to healing. The verses continue. It says, verse 15, But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple area, Hosanna to the, to the son of David, they were indignant. And this is many times where we stop. We're so worried about what everyone else is going to say. We're so worried about how people are going to point their fingers at us. We're so worried about how people might look down at us or, or put us down in some way. We're so worried about the world that we don't focus on His Word. And yet, if I were to say to you, listen, if you were to just start with prayer, you could be healed from everything. If you were just to, to, to get rid of all the, the stuff, if you were to spring clean within and get rid of the, all the evil, you and just focused on praying, talking to God constantly, He would heal you completely. Would you do so? Absolutely would. Now, here's the thing, though. These people became indignant. And if you look back at when Jesus was first coming into the city, their expectations of how 
how Jesus would overthrow everything were completely different than what God's expectations were. So when you ask for that healing, maybe your expectation is, oh, I've got to heal this, this, or this. It could be something physical, whatever it might be. But in this case, we don't know how it is that God will choose to heal that. But what we know is that when God heals it, He will heal it completely when we trust Him completely. Our job is just to take it to Him. Our job is to take whatever it is that is robbing us from the time that we have with the Lord. Whatever is taking our thoughts away from God. Whatever it is that everyone else is doing. Whatever it is that's making everyone else popular. Whatever else that, hey, uh, for young people, everyone else is getting physical. Everyone else is trying to vape. Everyone else is, is doing this, this latest drug. Everyone else is, you fill in the blank. What is it that's taking you away from God? Because God wants to heal that for you and for me. And it never stops. As you get older, it just changes. There's different things that we are robbed from when it comes to that time with God and giving it to Him completely. People are still going to put you down. The world is still going to put you down. But, Hosanna to the son of David, the children are shouting, Save you now. God can save you now. He can save me now from those things. Verse 16, Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Can you hear this? They're saying to Jesus, can you hear what these, these kids, they're saying, listen, listen, save us now. Do they not realize that, you know, we're the ones that are in charge here? Do they not understand that, like, we oversee the temple, that we've been in charge for, you know, hundreds and thousands of years, and now you're just going to walk in and, and turn things over and everything is fine? Watch what happens. Do, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? So in other words, he takes them right back to God's word. So when we have a struggle and we're not sure, instead of listening to what the world says, or instead of just, oh, this is what I think, we take it back to what God's word teaches us. Jesus takes them back to the scripture. And this is from Psalm 8. Verse 2, from the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. That praise, that very praise is the praise that comes when we see God working. And the very next verse it says, and, and he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Now this is very important. Jesus comes into the city. They're expecting this king. Everyone's seeing this. They, they, they know that this is taking place. The whole city is quaking. Oh my goodness, it's, it's happening. The Romans are making fun of it because there's always got to be someone to put it down. Oh, there's just one guy in a cult. We can take him. No big deal. We don't have to worry about this. And yet the whole place is quaking and this is the thing they've been looking for for their entire lives, generation after generation after generation. He goes to the very temple. He turns over the tables. He says, listen, this has to be a place of prayer. Something is robbing you from your time with God. And then the peop the very people that are in charge throw the guilt trip on him. They're like, do you hear what's going on? Do you hear this? And Jesus turns it back to God's word and says, look, this is what God's word says. So see, when we start with this personally, there can't help but be a change from the inside out. When we start with prayer, it then heads to the very things that are being robbed that we take away. And or, I'm sorry, that God will take away. And then from that, there is healing in it. But at that time, after that healing time, there is that moment where we make the decision to worship God for who God is. And what God is looking for each one of us is that childlike faith. That childlike faith that says, I don't care what other people say. I don't care how people are looking at it. I don't care, you know, if they put it down or put me down or make fun of me or those other kind of things. I am going to be a light to others. I am going to love others as Jesus loved me because that's what I am called to do. How do I know that? Because that is what is written in God's Word. If you were to take the entire New Testament and to shrink it down into two commands, two directives, two things that Jesus said. He said, love others as I have loved you. No conditions, complete sacrifice, caring for you in any way that is needed to point you to God. And then go and make disciples in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what we're called to do, to love and to care for others. We can't do so until 
We start with prayer. And we can't do so until we take whatever it is that we're being robbed of and allowing us to be robbed of to not focus on our time with God. But when we do that, there is healing in it, whether it's in our thoughts, whether it's in our heart, whether it's in our past. We can be healed completely from that. And it's at that time that we come to a place where we're like, I don't really care. I'm just going to be like a child. I'm going to be like that new believer that when I finally take that step, I realize, why have I been doing this my entire life? Why have I been struggling with this my entire life? Why is it that I've been allowing this to hold me down or to chain me this entire life? Why is it I'm still hearing the words that other people said or the other things as far as putting me down? Why am I doing that? When God will heal me from all those things. And if I'll just come to him with this childlike faith, I don't care who knows. In fact, I want others to know. I want people to know that, yeah, I was healed from this and I was saved from this. Hosanna, God saved me now from this the way only God can. And it's the same for the church. The church needs to get on board with this. The church needs to turn their house into a house of prayer. Because the people are going to be coming back. And they're going to have this time of worship. It's something that we've already talked about. And something that we plan to do here as a church. When we come back, we are going to have a prayer service. It's going to be a communion service. A night of communion and prayer. Where we come together and we celebrate, celebrate the sacrifice that God made for you and for me. But He didn't just die on that cross. We're going to celebrate the fact that He came back three days later and brought us life. It was the final sacrifice. And God made that sacrifice. He made that for you, and He made that for me. In this final verse, watch what it is that Jesus does. Verse 17. And He left them. That means He left the temple. He left all the people that were saying bad things, all the people that were putting Him down. All the people that were there that were praising him, all the people that were lifting him up, all of this stuff that was taking place that made the very city quake. He sent his message to them. Fix yourself personally, but don't try and do it on your own. Start with prayer. Whatever it is that's robbing you, put it away. And when you do that, you're going to find healing in it. And when you find that healing in it, you're going to, you can't help but be like a child and want to lift up who God is and what He has done in your life. And so He's heading out of the temple. He says, and He left them and He went out to the city of Bethany where He spent the night. Seems like kind of an odd sentence to kind of end this. Like this huge thing that's taken place. This great big thing where the city's quaking. And now he's just going to head out and go about two miles away to the city. And he's just going to kind of chill out. It doesn't tell us that people followed him. It doesn't tell us they came after him. Jesus left just the same way he came in. Not saying a word. And he heads out to Bethany. Bethany is the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So on the week that he is going to be heading back to be the final sacrifice, he spends it with the ones that he loves the most. With the ones that believe in him and the ones that believe in God and the ones who understand just who Jesus is. Lazarus, who he raised from the dead. Mary and Martha, who love or are full of hospitality and want to have nothing but that time with Jesus, understanding that He is God's Son. This is where Jesus is choosing to spend His final hours around the ones that He loves and the ones that love Him. We can't help but be there right now. We are quarantined. It's going to stay that way for a while. Your house, my house, needs to be a place of prayer. It needs to be a place of safety. It needs to be a place that when people come, whether it's family or within or direct family or their friends, because that's still happening some, that when they come in, that they can see a difference in us. That they can see that there is healing within God's Word. That they can know that this is their safe place. I've talked with people and they're like, oh my goodness, I've got to spend all this time with my spouse. Oh my goodness, all this time with my kids. And it's so loud and there's so many things going on. I just want to rest and all those other kind of things. This is God's house if you make it. You are God's temple if you make it. But it's a choice that you and I make personally. We can't help but be set aside right now. But is our house a place that Jesus would come to visit? Is our house a place that Jesus would come to spend time with us? Are our words loving? Are they kind? Are they lifting people up? Because the very people that we would be lifting up are the ones that God has entrusted us to within this life. The ones that we love the most and the ones that love us the most. 
So challenge yourself this week. Personally. Start personally. The king's coming. He's heading to make the ultimate sacrifice. He's going to die on the cross, and that's when everyone thinks it's the end. But three days later, he's going to rise from the dead, showing you and showing me that he can bring eternal life. Do you trust that? Do you believe that? And God would say to those that don't, stop for a moment and pray. Stop for a moment and lift your voice up to me that you will take whatever it is that's going on inside of you that's robbing you from the time with me and you'll put it aside. And when you realize that God is enough, that there is healing in that. And when you trust and believe and you profess and you say, God, you are enough and God, I believe you sent your son for me, that not only is there healing in that, but you can't help but have a childlike faith and say... <laughs> This is awesome. Why is it that I waited for so long? Why is it that I allowed all of the things that this world has to offer to hold me down when I have a loving Father that wants to lift me up? And then in the end, spend the time with those loved ones. And spend the time with those loved ones lifting up that very God, that very Son of God who gave everything for you. You know, there's two things within this world that, is willing to, that are willing to sacrifice everything for us. And that's part of what the lesson is going to be in the sunrise service that we have next week. Once again, that sunrise service is going to be live. It'll be anywhere from 6.50 to 7.07. We don't know what time exactly it's going to start. It's Jesus, and it's, in our world, the American soldier. They're willing to sacrifice. Now, a soldier goes in being a soldier knowing that there is the possibility that they could give everything. But they don't know it 100% for sure. A friend of mine, uh, a while back, we were talking, he was in Vietnam, and his wife shared with me that he won't ever talk about it. And um, I've shared the story with some of you, but we were heading to a baseball game of all places, and, and I'll never forget when, because the Republican National Convention was going on in Cleveland, we were heading to the, an Indians game. And so, it's, it's me, and it's my friend John, and he is uh, the Vietnam vet, and he's driving the truck, and uh, two of my sons are in the back. And so, Cleveland made the, just, this is such an intelligent decision, of shutting down every single parking meter in the city that day while the Indians game was going on because they wanted to prepare for when the Republican National Convention was going to be there. So you couldn't find anywhere to park. So John dropped off my two sons and they went in to the game and they were there for like five or six innings before we finally found a place to park and then we actually went into the game. But before that... They started asking John questions, and he started sharing with them what had taken place in Vietnam. And he was sharing the different things they were doing, and their job was to, to go in with the helicopters and to, to, um, to, to let people know where the bad guys were, because there's guys that are marching this way, and he didn't want his friends to die or to get shot up or any of those other kind of things. So his job was to find them and then to let them know, and then the high, bigger artillery and all that kind of stuff would come in to, to take care of that. So he's sharing these stories, and I'm watching my kids, and their eyes are getting bigger and bigger like oh my goodness you got to be kidding me and John's just nice and calm and he's just driving like no big deal and he's just like hey this is part of life we dropped the kids off and, and there was just a, a stirring inside of me and I just had to ask him so I just said John I got a question for you and he's like yeah and I go were you ever afraid while you were in Vietnam and he shared this with me he said John when I first got to Vietnam I was afraid he said it, whenever you start to make those flights and it, you, you realize that, man, this is for real now. All this training and everything we have, now it's for real. And he said, and I was completely fearful. He said, but each day the fear went away a little more, a little more until one day, this is what I'm doing. And I started thinking about the people around me and I started thinking about what they've sacrificed and people back home and all those other kind of things. And it just became, this is what I was called to do and this is what I was, I was meant to do. And he stayed calm and he was still driving, looking for a parking spot. And then he stopped for a minute and he looked at me and he said, and then one day I got my orders. And he said, in those orders, they told me that I'll be heading back at a certain date. And that's when the fear started again. And the fear set in because I realized, oh my goodness, I'm getting closer every day to seeing my loved ones. And then I got scared again until I finally made it and I made it back. Every single day, every single day, we are getting closer to heaven. 
And just like your home now would not be the same without those loved ones, heaven would not be the same without those loved ones. And so as we get closer, and we don't know, Jesus could come back right now. With all the crazy stuff that's going on, we could lose friends, we could lose family, we don't have any idea. But God made that sacrifice through His Son. I don't want heaven to be heaven without the people that I love. You don't want heaven to be heaven without the people that you love. Until we make ourselves a house of prayer, until we take whatever it is that's robbing us from our time with God, until we realize that man with the childlike faith that we can come to Him, that He's already made this final sacrifice. And when we accept that, then we can share that with others. Because at some point in some time, you start to have that fear that you're going to be going home. The older you get, things start to happen. I started coughing this week, and I'm like, oh my goodness, what if I caught the virus? And then I was, you know, fine a little bit later. And people, when they start, to, that starts to get, it starts to creep in their mind. How do we get this? And I, there was one day I didn't want to ride down the road with my sunroof open, because I'm like, oh, this thing goes through the air, and what if I catch this? I mean, we put these natural fears in us, and then I stop long enough to pray to allow God to take that away. In the end... As we get closer, there's going to be a fear, not that we are going to die, but there's going to be a fear of the people around us not knowing that they have eternity in their hearts. And it starts in your home, but it starts with you personally. And until we make that personal decision, we can't share it with others. And we can't show them that the sacrifice that God made through His Son was the final sacrifice because He loved us that much. Challenge yourself this week with the prayer. Challenge yourself this week to get rid of whatever is robbing you. Challenge yourself this week then to rest in that healing and then to be that childlike faith to share with others. Because Easter is going to be a beginning. Easter is going to be about new beginnings. It's not going to be about the end. The rising sun, because we're doing the sunrise service, isn't just about the sun that rises in the east. It's about the sun that rose for you and for me with that final sacrifice. As Mike and Brendan and Cody head up, we're going to sing this last song in worship. You have been sent and I have been sent someplace for a reason for the next however long. We don't know. None of us have any idea. But would you challenge yourself, especially if you're not a believer, to come humbly before God. To come before Him and to say to Him, God, you made the ultimate sacrifice for me. You gave everything so that I would have a place in eternity with you. And today, and we'll take a break here in a moment, you will have this opportunity to pray. So we'll start with a worship song. And as we start within this worship song, and you can start to sing this or even just to listen to this, you're going to have this opportunity to stop whatever it is that's robbing you from your time with God. To reach up to Him through your words and through your heart to pray. And it's at that time that you will find that healing that will last for eternity. And you can take that to God as a child, just as a child would, and say, God, heal me from all these things. And take this from me, and I want to accept your love through your sacrifice. Heavenly Fathers, we come to you, God, within this last final song as, as our praise team um, is going to bring before us. Lord, this Palm Sunday is a time when the King entered. This Palm Sunday was a time when the King entered to bring peace. This Palm Sunday was the time when, when Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, entered the temple. So God, in this first verse, as we lift our voices and our hearts up to you, Lord, would you allow us personally, for those that are believers out there, to put everything aside, whatever it is that's robbing us from worshiping you 100% through prayer. And God, for those that don't know you, Lord, to help them understand that they can put this aside and they can reach up to you in prayer. God, heal us from whatever it is that is holding us back from you. 
God, help us to live this week. Help us to live every single day with that childlike faith and that promise of eternal life that you gave us through your son, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. If you're someone today that has never taken that step of faith, and it's a step that you want to take, as the song says, it's to give me Jesus. In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. And it starts by us sharing within our hearts and with our voice, just talking straight to God. To ask Him to come into our life and to take all the stuff away so that through His sacrifice that we would be healed and through His sacrifice that it would bring life. If you're sitting there today and you've never taken that step, that prayer sounds something like this. These aren't the exact words, but these are the words that you can share with God. It starts by letting God know, God, listen, I know that I struggle. I know there's something that is robbing me of a relationship with you. There's something that is keeping me back. And God, the thing about it is, at the end of the day, it, it's not all the stuff that's going on in the world. It's me allowing all the stuff that's going on in the world. It's choices I made. It's struggles I had. And man, it's just wearing me out. But at the end of the day, God... I know that I struggle and I do things that you don't want me to do. And your word, it tells me that's called sin. And God, I don't want to do that anymore. Does that mean I'm going to be perfect? No, I'm not. But God, you love me so much that you gave everything. You made the ultimate sacrifice for me. I don't know why. I don't know why you would do that for me. Because I'm just me. And yet you chose to. You chose to because you love me just the way that I am. So God, today, I'm going to put all these things aside. Today, Lord, I want to be healed from all the things that I struggle with. I want to be able to cast all those thoughts on you, all the stuff that goes in my heart that is negative, all the, the things that, are, that happen, that, the, the struggles I have, the past, you name it, God. I want to give it all to you. And I'm going to take this step with you today through faith. God, I just want you to know that, that I believe in you. God, I believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me. And God, from this day forward, I want to ask you into my heart as my powerful, my passionate, and my personal Savior. That's the step that we take. Now, if you took that today and you're with family members, if you took that today and that's a step that you took and you have someone within your household that is a believer, talk to them about it. Share with them. Say, that's a step that I took or that's a step that I want to take. And then it's between you and God. And that family member is there to share and to talk about those things with that childlike faith to say, I don't understand it and I don't get it, but yep, God loves you just like God loves me. And if you may be someone who is at home on their own, and you're like, that's a step that I took. It's great that you took between you and God. But if you want to talk to somebody about it or share it with someone, send me an email. PastorJohn at HighPointChristian.org Let us know. We'll respond to it. We'll happily do so. It's a step that you take between you and God. It's a step of faith that you take. It's a step that brings healing. It's also a step that brings that childlike faith that you can't help but tell and share with others the love that God has poured through you. Challenge yourself once again this week. Turn this temple into a temple of prayer. Whatever it is robbing you, put it away. Find that healing in it. Find that childlike faith. And next week we'll worship together again live both in the morning at sunrise for Easter and then also at the 1030 service. Mike, Brendan, Cody, you're going to finish with this final uh, verse and then we will see you next week. Thank you.